After failing in their initial attempts, the men from Beach Jumper Unit 1 were ready for a second try. On July 11th, 1943, as the night waves crashed against the Italian shore and with an enemy-occupied lighthouse in the vicinity, several U.S. Navy-customized 63-foot air sea rescue boats made their way into the ocean. The men had one mission, to create as much noise as possible and grab the attention of the enemy troops stationed nearby. Using jamming transmitters, alarms, special reflective equipment, spotlights, and speakers that created loud sounds that mimicked a D-Day-like beach invasion, one small Navy unit managed to fool the enemy into believing a full-scale amphibious landing was taking place right before their eyes. The Art of Deception Navy officer Douglas Fairbanks Jr. was a lifelong fan of ships and coveted an illustrious nautical career. However, with little to no experience and no university degree, the established Hollywood actor resorted to his lengthy list of high society contacts. After writing to his longtime family friend, British Chief of Combined Operations Lord Louis Mountbatten, the royal family member welcomed the American and his staff as a liaison officer to learn about their commando operations. Once in Great Britain, Fairbanks took part in the observation, planning, and execution of the commando's raiding parties, diversions, and deception operations. After learning about explosives, camouflage, and the operation of specialty landing craft, he participated in pajama raids, dangerous combined ops nighttime cross-channel hit-and-run assaults on German outposts. Fairbanks was enamored with the military art of deception, and when he returned to the U.S., he presented Admiral Ernest J. King, a commander-in-chief of the U.S. fleet and chief of naval operations, with an idea for a unit that would be specifically trained for tactical cover, diversionary, and deception missions. On March 5, 1943, King formally authorized the recruitment of 180 men for the program. As a lieutenant, Fairbanks did not possess enough rank to command the unit, so Admiral H. Kent Hewitt, then commander of amphibious forces and all U.S. naval forces in northwest African waters and the western Mediterranean, was selected to lead the new endeavor. Beach Jumpers On March 16, 1943, the first volunteers arrived at the amphibious training base in Virginia. According to the Navy announcement, the men were signing up for a prolonged, hazardous, distant duty in an ultra-secret project. In order to qualify, volunteers had to be resistant to seasickness, have experience with small boat handling and operations, basic electrical knowledge, and celestial navigation proficiency. The Special Warfare Unit's primary mission was, according to the Navy, quote, to assist and support the operating forces in the conduct of tactical cover and deception in naval warfare. The volunteers had a deception equipment kit put together to carry out psychological warfare missions, including a multi-component heater consisting of a wire recorder, amplifier and speaker, jamming transmitters, and naval balloons with strips of radar reflective window attached to them. With this technology, a few dozen men could simulate large amphibious landings, making the enemy believe that they were a massive 70,000-man amphibious landing force, when in fact the units would be a safe distance away. Meanwhile, the actual attack troops would begin their operations somewhere else. Over two months, the first volunteers learned about boat handling, seamanship, ordnance, gunnery, demolition, pyrotechnics, and meteorology. And on May 25, 1943, Beach Jumper Unit 1 was officially commissioned. It was the first of nine organized units during World War II. The official story states that the beach jumpers got their name from their ability to quickly hit the beach and cause confusion with the harassment and deception operations. However, others believe that the nickname originated when a scientist working with the Navy described the unit's purpose as, quote, scare the bejesus out of the enemy. The derived term BJ factor was constantly used in the unit's planning from then on, leading to the inspiration for the beach jumpers' cover name. Operation Husky The men from BJU-1 did not have to wait long for their first mission. They would help the Allied invasion of Sicily less than two months after they finished training. Codenamed Operation Husky, the assault on Sicily was a major campaign of the European theater in which the Allies attempted to take back the Italian island. On the night of July 10, 1943, 
Beach Jumper Unit 1 was ordered to conduct a diversion off Cape San Marco to keep the Germans away from Husky's southern landing beaches, where the actual invasion would begin. The unit was assigned 10 63-foot customized air-sea rescue boats, manned by an officer and a crew of six men. Along with the unit's specialty deception equipment, the boats were equipped with twin 50 caliber machine guns, window rockets, explosive packs, and smoke pots. Still, Navy officials predicted significant losses for the unit, as they would face insurmountable hazards in their small vessels. Consequently, each beach jumper was ordered to pack their personal items in a crate so they could be collected by their next of kin. In fact, the men's families knew nothing of their activities, since the slightest information leak could ruin the most brilliant deceptions. After sortieing from Pantelleria, a newly captured island about 150 miles away from Sicily's western coast, the unit's first attempt was recalled due to hazardous seas. It wouldn't be until the next day that the unit would achieve the unimaginable. A clever deception. The operation was launched on July 11, 1943, at 10 p.m. Three of the air sea rescue boats prepared their heaters 3,000 yards away from the shore, while another sailed 1,000 yards ahead to lay smoke. As the sound boats silently prepared for their operation, an enemy-occupied searchlight illuminated the area, followed by arms and artillery fire. Then, at 2.30 a.m., the ASR crews secured their heater and gear, sped towards the beach, and fired their guns and rockets. They then pivoted and retreated, leaving the Axis forces in total confusion. All the boats triumphantly sailed back to their home port at Pantelleria. Still, the beach jumpers' participation in Operation Husky was not over. When Officer Fairbanks, stationed aboard Commander Hewitt's flagship, found out that a British aerial bombing diversion operation had been postponed, he convinced his superiors to substitute it with a nighttime beach jumpers' operation. To keep the Germans' attention, the unit was ordered to conduct another operation the following night using all available craft. This time, the shore batteries were completely alerted beforehand. As the night approached the following evening, 11 air-sea rescue boats and 8 patrol torpedo boats split into two groups and staged sequential coastal diversions between Mazara di Vallo and Granatola, farther up Sicily's western coast. Group A struck just as the moon went down, with one boat dashing ahead of the others to fire guns, launch rockets, and lay smoke. The other group's subsequent sounds, balloons, pyrotechnics, fake radio chatter, and radar jamming soon sparked a counterattack from enemy searchlights, artillery, and machine gun fire. While Group A escaped the fire and overwhelming disorder, Group B almost didn't. Before they could even begin their nighttime operations, shore batteries had targeted them with accurate radar-controlled heavy fire. Ultimately, Operation Husky was significantly helped by the mental uncertainty generated by the diversions and deceptive operations. With the beach jumpers' participation, an entire German reserve division stationed in the west stayed in place as the actual Husky invaders secured beachheads well into the south and east. And while six-inch salvos were fired towards the vessels, there were no reported casualties, and the men from Beach Jumpers Unit 1 were able to unpack their crates when they returned to base. Recognizing Fairbanks' imagination and critical thinking, Vice Admiral Hewitt promoted the lieutenant to Special Operations Officer and made him directly responsible for all Beach Jumper operations. Legacy Through the remainder of World War II, a total of 11 beach jumper units lived up to their name in several worldwide mission deployments. All throughout the theaters, the beach jumpers assaulted and raided beaches, creating as much chaos and commotion as possible for the Axis forces, deceiving and harassing them wherever they went. In 1944, three beach jumpers units received the Presidential Unit Citation for their involvement in the Allied invasion of southern France during Operation Dragoon. And even after World War II came to a close and the Special Warfare Units were deactivated, the U.S. Navy continued to believe in the significance of the beach jumpers. As the United States entered a new kind of war, Navy brass turned to Captain Phil Bucklew to re-establish the units. Bucklew was a leading collaborator in the initial commission and earned two Navy crosses during their D-Day landings and Operation Husky. Despite several objectors that question the value of a deception unit in modern times, Beach Jumper Units 1 and 2 were officially reactivated in June of 1952 to support the Navy's Pacific and Atlantic fleets. 
The units comprised 10 officers and 18 enlisted men, and the new beach jumpers were trained in amphibious reconnaissance, demolition and hand-to-hand -hand combat, intelligence gathering, physical training, swimming, and seamanship. As the Cold War evolved through the 1950s and early 1960s, the beach jumper niche expertise in manipulative and imitative deception and electronic warfare was utilized in several new ways, including close collaboration with the CIA. During the Vietnam War, several beach jumper units were responsible for tactical deception operations and for employing psychological processes, psyops, and their unclassified cover activity during the conflict. The beach jumper name was then retired in 1972, and the missions were absorbed by other types of units. From the late 1980s to this day, the Fleet Tactical Deception Group Pacific and Fleet Tactical Deception Group Atlantic are the units that assist Navy commanders in the planning and execution of tactical military deception operations. Due to their classified status, many of the original jumpers from the successful Operation Husky went to their graves without ever revealing to their loved ones what they'd done in the Navy during World War II. Thank you for watching our Dark Docs video. Before you go, please share your thoughts on the beach jumpers in the comment section below. And for more history-based content, don't forget to subscribe to all of our Dark Documentaries channels. Stay tuned.